My name is Jeff Abramowitz. I'm the CEO of the PD Green Program. And I promise you, for the next hour, you're going to be thoroughly engaged. And for those that don't know, the PD Green Program is this um, just incredible organization. It is a nonprofit organization that you are really in for a treat today because not often do you have the opportunity to be in the room with some of the founders of this great organization. And um, in fact, it's the brain trust of uh, Charlie Puttkammer, who, Charlie, raise your hand, who, there you go. And Charlie's wife and family are here. There are some members of our board here. A past president of the PD Green Board you're gonna hear from today. And it's really, uh, it's an amazing opportunity for me as you're gonna hear about why it's so special as we talk today. But it's a wonderful organization that dedicates itself to using college students and volunteers throughout the country, including here at Princeton, to go inside of our prisons and jails and to help people get smarter so that when they come out of prison and our jail system, that they're ready for the next journey in their life. It is a, a wonderful organization that you're gonna hear bits and pieces about today, and I'm going to tell you and give you some information before we leave today of how you can volunteer and participate in the PD Green program, and I don't want to, uh, so you hear a lot about that. But I want to get right to our panel discussion today. We have two unbelievable guests with us today. The first, Yusuf Dahl, and the second is Udi Afer. Um, I will tell you, I tried, I slaved last night trying to figure out like how I could possibly condense their awesome, incredible bios into less than an hour, and it was impossible. <laughs> it, it was impossible. Um, and I think the best thing to do is allow them to tell you themselves um, their passion and who they are. So we're gonna get kicked off today, and I'm gonna throw this and start this discussion off today with something simple. Sorry, I wander a little bit. but. The simple question I have for both of you to introduce yourself to these wonderful folks. And if you could answer this question for me, if you were to have a highlight reel on ESPN and I was showing it today, what would this audience be seeing? Well, I don't think go. I would make the highlights for ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not ESPN, but I think for some other things. So just why don't you kick us off? And yeah. if you're comfortable with the mic, unless everybody can hear, it's up to you. Can everyone hear me, or would the microphone be helpful? I think everyone's good. So, no, I think they said microphone. Oh, they said the microphone. Yeah. Oh, wow. Normally, I'm too bad. Okay. No. No microphone. Oh, no microphone. No I'm, microphone. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I thought that's what okay. you said. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Yusuf Dahl. It's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure to be back on campus. Uh, a graduate of SPIA, class of 2017. Um, I've been involved with the PD Green program really since my time as a, a graduate student. So I had the privilege of volunteering at uh, the Wagner uh, Youth Correctional Facility in Bordingtown, New Jersey. Uh, after graduation, I stayed involved in the organization. I, I see Jim Farron, my good friend uh, here, former executive director. Uh, and so I joined the board and, and most recently served as the board president. Uh, originally from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and, and education is, when we talk about perhaps this highlight reel, education, maybe not the highlight, but certain the consistent thread um, that's present uh, throughout my life. So uh, at 18, I was sentenced to prison for 10 years for the distribution of drugs. Uh, Milwaukee, uh, like I think a lot of urban areas in this city, is, or in this country, is a, a tale of two cities. Uh, so there's parts of Milwaukee that are flourishing, vibrant, and then there's the part of Milwaukee where I come from where over half of the black men by the age of 30 have some level of justice involvement. And, and so let me repeat that because that number is truly as shocking as it, it may sound at first. Over half of the black men in the city of Milwaukee by the age of 30 have some level of justice involvement. So for my family, that meant my older brother uh, preceded me uh, to prison, and so did, so did my father. So, you know, behind bars, uh, through a program, wasn't as good as PD Green, uh, so I am so thankful that Charlie and, and the class of 58 started it. But, but through education, uh, when I was behind bars, I put myself on a new trajectory, and I'm excited to share some of those things with you today. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone, and it's great to see some students here. Um, and I appreciate everyone coming, particularly at the 4 o'clock hour on a Friday, where I know everyone is having their uh, the beginning of their drinking sessions for the day. <laughs> um, so I particularly appreciate this. Um, 
So look, my path to where I am today is actually, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not a common one. I, w I was born in Israel, so I'm an immigrant to the United States. And when we first moved to the United States, we didn't have a lot of money. There were five of us in a one bedroom apartment in Brooklyn. And I like to say it, uh, real Brooklyn, not the yuppie Brooklyn, not Park Slope Brooklyn, <laughs> um, more like Sheepshead Bay, Graven's Neck Road, Brooklyn, for those of you who may know uh, it a bit. Um, and this was during the, the Giuliani years. Um, and New York City was a really fascinating uh, place at that time where, you know, for white families, there was one experience of, of the Giuliani years and particularly for low income communities of color, there was a very different experience. And it was my first awakening to a lot of the issues that then I dedicated my career to. So I remember, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, um, um, you know, reading and hearing about the Abner Louima case, the Amadou Diallo case. I tell my students, right, that the term 41 shots for my generation is the same as for this generation's I can't breathe, right? Because I remember, you know, becoming involved in, you know, discussions and protests when Amadou Diallo was shot 41 times for going into his pocket to show his ID in response to a stop by the NYPD Street Crimes Unit. And that was my entry point to these issues of, 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 of criminal justice reform. Um, if I think of my highlight reel, um, you know, I spent almost all of my career at the ACLU. I was there for 20 years. I started teaching here at SPIA in 2018. I came on full time to SPIA just last year. And before that, I was at the ACLU for 20 years. And I think the thing, even though I'm trained as a lawyer, I'm a civil rights lawyer, I've litigated, I've had you know, meetings at the White House, I was the lead ACLU liaison on criminal justice issues with Congress. But the, what I'm most um, proud of is my work at the ACLU trying to change the narrative around issues of law and order and tough on crime. And that's what I'm dedicating so much of my time now at SPIA to think about, right? We have this tendency in the United States um, and you're seeing this reflected in so many different ways um, um, where we boil down issues of law and order and crime to conversations that are dehumanizing, right? We talk about felons, we talk about thugs, we talked about prisoners. And I remember when I took on a leadership role at the National ACLU to head our criminal justice reform advocacy work, one of the first things that I did was literally take out a black marker and start crossing out those words. And saying, no, instead of saying prisoner, say, you know, people in prison. You know, say someone who's formerly incarcerated. Say someone who's, you know, experiencing substance use disorder. And kind of changing the language of how we think about these issues. But then in addition to that, starting to change some of our practices. So if I had to, look, I have a career where I was blessed. I've probably worked on 300 different pieces of legislation that have become law. Um, but I think the event that I was most proud of was in 2018, there's a big New York Times article on this, um, where there was a race for Suffolk County DA. So Suffolk County, Boston, anyone here from Boston? All right, so she's not a very popular DA right now, or she, you know, she was US attorney, she resigned, oh, yeah. but this is, yeah, Rachel Rollins yeah. is who I'm talking about. But at that time, there was a very contested race for the district attorney of Suffolk County, which is, you know, it's, it's Boston and some of the suburbs. Um, and this was an issue, I was very passionate, my job at the ACLU was to, re, you know, to end mass incarceration in America. That was literally my, my job. And at the ACLU, we're all lawyers, we're lobbyists, we're litigators, but I always felt like we're never gonna litigate our way out of this issue. And kind of as the theme of, as I'm catching on is we have to change the narrative. And one of the ways that I wanted to change the narrative was change the role of prosecutor in America, where they no longer just looked at themselves as the only benchmark that they're gonna use when they pitch themselves for reelection is how many convictions did they get, you know, and, and how long are the sentences, but they actually started taking responsibility for changing people's lives. Right, from improving public safety by making people um, succeed and, and take out a positive vision. And one of the strategies that we deployed, so it's a long wind up, was we held a debate for the Suffolk County DA 
inside the Suffolk County Jail, where all of the candidates for district attorney had to go inside the jail. They sat at a table that was maybe twice the length of this table. And the people that they were facing, you all, were people who were currently incarcerated in that jail. And the only people that could ask them questions during that debate were people who were currently incarcerated in that jail. And I got to tell you, I was like the guy all the way in the back, like watching it. This was my idea. And I was literally crying the whole time because it was such a powerful shift in narrative, in power, in accountability. Where suddenly when the district attorney candidates, right, and, and I think you, this is a sophisticated crowd. You know the district attorneys are the single most powerful actor in the criminal legal system. They get to decide who to prosecute, what to charge them with. You know, are they going to seek cash bail or not? Are they going to seek a, a, a habitual offender offense? Are they going to uh, charge you under a mandatory minimum? Well, they have so much discretion, right? 95% of all guilty verdicts in America come from a plea bargain. Right, this image that we all have of justice that comes from TV, right, of like two opposing sides, of like, but your honor, I'm not guilty, yes you are, you know, and it's like, that doesn't happen. The way justice happens in America is in a hallway, behind closed doors, or in public, we're like, listen, assault a third. No, my, you know, he really deserves, you know, trespass. Okay, let's agree, like, you know, um, you know trespass in the first degree, time served, done. Right, that, that's literally how most, the vast majority of cases are decided. This was a shift. Like we were like, okay, no. When prosecutors are making these huge decisions, we want them to humanize the issue. So we had the candidates for DA debating cash bail, debating mandatory minimums, debating you know, life sentences in front of the people who are gonna face the consequences of decisions and they had to explain it to them. And to me, that was like, <clears throat> wow. Moment. So that's not an ESPN reel. That's like the Super Bowl right there. <laughs> that's like, yeah, that's huge. So I think we need to set some context. And there's a lot of things you just threw out there. And I think, I think, I think Yusuf is waiting. He just can't wait to jump, jump on some of those. But I think we need to set the context. So I do believe a person without facts is just another person with an opinion. And I think we need to understand the, the nature of our justice system today. We have 2.1 million people incarcerated in our country today. And about half of them, about half a million people um, are there and have not been convicted yet. They're behind bars simply because they can't afford cash bail. We have a cash bail system. Uh, we should know about 600,000 people come back from our prison jails back into our communities every single year. About 600,000 people return. Now, we spend in our country $60 billion, $60 billion in this system, and yet Within three to five years, two thirds of those men and women are going to be back behind the walls. So in context, we spend $60 billion and we fail two thirds of the time. About 40,000 barriers exist for men and women as they come home from um, incarceration that exist. And that results in approximately a 27% unemployment rate for men and women that are entering the workforce. Put that in perspective, that's higher than the peak of the Great Depression. Yet, just taking one class, just one class inside of a prison or jail can reduce the recidivism rate by 43%, just one class. So those are the facts in the context of today. And I think we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of guests here today, and I want to throw this first to, to Yusuf. Um, why should we care? Why should we care? Why advocate for change in the criminal justice system? Um, well, I, I think the simple answer is because it affects all of us. Um, incarceration or justice involvement has become so ubiquitous um, that we all know somebody. We have some proximity uh, to somebody who has uh, had an impact or an interaction with the, the criminal legal system. And so because of that, it really does behoove us to create a system um, that doesn't perpetuate the systemic disadvantage that oftentimes led people uh, to interact with this system, but to create on-ramps to opportunity. Because like you said, the vast majority of people who are incarcerated come home. Like that's just the reality of it. 
So when I was sentenced to prison when I was 18 years old, I knew I was going to have a chance to come home and do something with my life. So I was released at 23. And it's really just a, an, an option we have as a country. Are we going to use that justice involvement as an opportunity to rehabilitate an individual and provide opportunity? Or is it all about retribution and perpetuation of the very factors that led to that outcome to begin with? So I want to take us a step further because in, in your work, you know, I mentioned the over 40,000 barriers mm -hmm. that affect people coming home. And it's everything from getting transportation, a driver's license, to identification, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, housing, to food, shelter, you name it. There's mm -hmm. so many of these barriers and many of them uh, re relate to employment. Um, in your work in particular, Yusuf, you've done some amazing work. Can you share with us um, one of the challenges that you work directly with and some of the things that you're doing to try and fix some of that? Yeah, so another thread of my life has been housing. Um, so when I was released from prison in 2003, shortly thereafter, I had a fortuitous encounter with a, a, a guy who I was trying to rent a property from. And, you know, he showed me a bunch of properties and I said, well, wow, you must really, you know, be doing well in this business. And he said, yes, real estate is, is great. Everyone should do it. You should do it. And I said, well, there's two problems. I said, one, I don't know anything about real estate. Like at the time, I didn't even know what caught was, just to give you some context. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I had no money. And this guy, if you met him, he was one of these individuals you could just tell there was something about him, right? He was really smart. He was really resourceful. And just because he did it, didn't mean you could necessarily do it. So about two months later, he sent his brother over to collect his rent. And there were two things that, that stood out about that encounter. One, his brother was nothing like him. There was nothing exceptional about his brother. <laughs> and two, his brother drove a Lexus. And I said, well, if his brother can do it, hell, I know I can do it. <laughs> and so I started a uh, property management and development firm and grew to 200 units of affordable housing in the city of Milwaukee. And, you know, it was really that experience that opened up a lot of other opportunities for me. But now let's talk about um, the, the flip side of that. So that was the opportunity I had in housing. But what I'm involved in right now really epitomizes um, the challenges when we talk about systemic discrimination. Because we, we, we hear this word a lot, but like, like, what does it mean to have the system against you? So... A year ago, uh, my family relocated to Pennsylvania. I, I lead an education organization in the state. And, you know, we're looking for housing. I have a, she was, my daughter is a high schooler, so a rising ninth grader. So as you can imagine, you know, the quality of the education was paramount for our family as we considered communities. So we found a town home in a good school district. We wanted to try this community out. And I was denied housing because of my conviction from 25 years ago. And, you know, at first, I, you know, I get the call and I'm just like, excuse me? This is Yusuf Dahl. Do you have the right person? Like, I, I couldn't, I, I could not believe what I was hearing. And, you know, the poor woman, she's just like, whatever, a property manager. I, you know, can't lean into her too hard. But as I, I did my research, it turns out there is an amendment to the 1988 Fair Housing Amendments Act introduced by a senator from South Carolina named Strom Thurmond. And folks in this room, I, I think, know about his legacy and, and, and his agenda. And so what this piece of legislation does, which is still the law of the land today, is it permanently excludes fair housing protections for anyone with a drug distribution conviction. And so it doesn't matter that in the ensuing 25 years, I've created jobs, I've created opportunities, I've created housing. It doesn't matter that I've graduated from Princeton. Nothing matters other than the fact that 25 years ago, when I was 18 years old, I made a poor decision. 
And what really motivated me to take this issue on, so I, I, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, and I'm currently featured in a Vice documentary, so if anyone got to Paramount Plus, uh, you can learn more about this issue. Maybe Petey Green will do a screening at some point. Sure. But, but what really made me decide to change this issue is when I looked at my daughter. Because at the end of the day, excluding me from a particular neighborhood really didn't matter. I prefer to live in a more urban, dense area. The food is better. Walkability <laughs> is better. But the fact is it now limited the educational opportunities that my daughter had. And so our family was fortunate where we were able to enroll her in an independent school. But all I could think about are those individuals and families that did not have the resources that we had. And so if you don't give children access to opportunities and communities that foster opportunity, what's going to be the outcome? Ouch, he could just drop the mic there. So, uh, that was, that was, yeah, um, so I'm throwing it over to you um, because you know, I'm curious from your perspective, you work with students all the time, you work in the ACLU, the challenges that you see uh, people facing as they come home and the work that yeah. you've done, what would you say those big barriers are that we should kind of all be aware of? So I'll preface this by saying that, and I said this this morning, I believe in, I'm a big Ted Lasso fan, and I, I think that we should all be curious, not judgmental. It's a great line that, that was quoted in there. But I'm curious, I think we're all curious. Like yeah. what, what questions should we be asking? What are those barriers yeah. that that you've worked through, that you work through with your students here, that we should be addressing, we should all be aware of? So I have so many answers, but I'm not gonna actually give any of them. <laughs> because I'm, I'm trying something new, and you guys are a bit of an experiment, and you have the privilege of now hearing from a professor who's like deep in the weeds on this issue and thinking of new ways to tackle it. Right? One, of the, one of the things that I'm dedicating my academic career to is how do you defeat tough on crime politics? What? Tough on crime politics which is a term that we use to describe when candidates run for office, most, most candidates think in 30 second sound bites, right? Um, and what images do they decide to show? What talking point do they decide to give? And what impact that has on policymaking? Because it's, uh, let me give you just a bit of background, right? Because what, the reason we have 2 million people incarcerated in America right now, right? The reason that the US is the large, well actually we're no longer the largest incarcerator in the world. Now I think we're number three, um, but we're still by far the biggest when compared to Western industrialized countries. I mean, we have like 10 times to 15 times the rate of incarceration than places like Germany or Australia or Canada, right? But, 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 but what has been well documented is what the, one of the primary reasons this ha happened is not because crime went up. In fact, crime in this country has been steadily decreasing, including over the last two years, which did go up. And it's very important to recognize that because that has real world impact, but it's still at relatively historic lows. I mean, when I was growing up in New York City, there were 2,000 murders a year in New York City. That was the peak, which was, um, I'm pretty sure that was 1989 or 1990 was the peak. New York City last year, even though Fox News, you know, their narrative is you can't walk in New York City without getting shot and killed because homicides did go up over the last two years. I think last year was 400 murders. Again, that's 400 too many. And please don't read anything that I'm saying as minimizing that, especially if you're the family member or the person. And it, is, it did represent a spike. But it is way, way, way way below from what it was at its height. Yet that's not how it feels right now. And that feeling drives policymaking, right? Because right now, if you're a criminal justice reformer, your main battle right now is preventing new mandatory minimum laws on fentanyl from passing in every state. You know, we have the president of the United States, Joe Biden, tweeting about a month ago about carjacking in DC. That was a tweet that he sent. Why? Because DC, went through a democratic process where they overhauled their penal code. And part of that overhaul was reducing the mandatory minimums on carjacking from, I think, 18 years to 15 years. 
that I'm, I'm not even exaggerating here. It was still a mandatory minimum, and it was still egregious when compared to any other industrialized nation. And the president of the United States tweeted about that, saying we cannot be soft on crime. You know, we can't, so, and he vetoed. Or actually, he signed into law Congress passing a veto, an overrule of the DC package. Why? Because the politics right now don't align with that policy. Everything that Youssef said is so reasonable. It's so correct. It is accurate. Yet I believe that doesn't matter. Because what, if, if, if the battle for mass incarceration or to end mass incarceration was about who has the better data set, who, you know, there are professors at SPIA that have literally proven scientifically that for every community-based organization that you open, crime goes down. They prove causation. Yet it doesn't matter because the politics don't align. So my whole thinking is how do we change the politics? So to the question that you asked Yusef in the beginning of why does this matter, I want to give an answer that you're probably not used to hearing someone like me say. The reason it matters is because of love. The reason it matters is because I love my fellow human being. I love my neighbor. And the analogy I want to draw, which is, bear with me for a second, I'm thinking this through, <laughs> is the marriage equality movement in America. Lawyer, I love equality. I mean, we're all we're printed. We love equality, but the public is like, okay, equality again, but they, they weren't feeling it. Then literally, the movement changed, and the slogan became, "Love." We should have marriage because I want to start a family, and I love this person. I want to spend the rest of my life with him, and that's why you should support marriage equality. And it's like everything changed. It's like, oh. Uh-huh, yeah, that feels right. And none of the, look, I'm not saying the data is not important, that these statistics are important, but we just completely dehumanize the issue. And I actually feel like the reformer side is not even doing a good job humanizing, because we're just throwing data points. No, 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 we got to reduce recidivism at this percentage points. No, 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 we don't. And I love the data, and please don't read anything I'm saying. I'm, I'm at SPIA, right? We're all about data, and I'm saying that's right, but that's not going to change President Biden from tweeting about carjacking. Even though every statistic and every data point shows that a 15 year mandatory minimum and that people don't say, I'm not gonna carjack today because I will go to prison for 15 years or for 18 years instead of 15 years. That's not how things happen and he knows it. So that's what I'm really passionate about. So we have a lot. And for that reason, you asked me the question around, you know, recidivism and reentry. The, 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 it's nearly 45,000 legal restrictions of people when they leave prison. The one that I think speaks to everything that we just talked about is felony disenfranchisement. Because that one goes to core person's humanity and dignity. Right now in America, how many states allow people to vote in prison? Who knows this? One? Zero? No, it's better than that, but not that much. Two! Which ones? The two whitest states in the country, <laughs> Maine and Vermont, yeah. right? The only two states in America that allow people to vote in prison. During the last presidential election, when this was proposed, even the Democratic side, none of the Democratic candidates were willing to say people should have the right to vote in prison except for Bernie Sanders because he represents Vermont. To me, that goes to the core of how we just dehumanize people as if they don't, they're not even worthy of the vote. It's the only category of people other than based on age that we still disenfranchise in America. And the last thing I'll say, I went to Germany when I was at the ACLU to study the prison system there. And I'm Israeli by birth. I come from family that will still not buy a German product because I have family that were killed or survived the Nazi Holocaust. So this wasn't an easy trip for me. But I remember sitting with the head of the Justice de Department there and telling him that in America, we prevent people from the right to vote in prison. And the guy almost fell over. Because his view was like, 
Are you kidding me? We like bring the voting booths into the prisons because that's how you make people feel whole. That's how you make them feel committed to their community. That's how you empower them. And it's like a totally different shift in how we think about this. And that's what I'm passionate about. You just so set the table. So before we go- And there's I, a hand up, I want to say. Okay, one sec. Um, we, the New York Times uh, writer in the back, just make sure you quote him correctly on that. <laughs> um, yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I wanted, you mentioned a lot about the politics of it all. So I'm assuming that you're specifically talking about bodies for profit and just like, how people are getting rich off of people living in cages. Um, but also, um, um, sorry, can I put off the thing? That's okay, no, you already said, I can actually, can I respond to that for a sec? Yeah. Because that is actually, look, I love what you said, but it's actually one of the misconceptions in America. The biggest profiteer off of incarceration is the government, 100%. By far, only about 8% of the two million people incarcerated in America are in private prisons. Right. Now, some states that's more, so Arizona, I think it's like 20%, maybe 25%. Also in the immigration context, private companies do. But government is the one that profits off of incarceration. What do I mean by that? Counties, running jails, you know, uh, handing out jobs, creating the infrastructure. Now there are private companies that profit even from government prisons because the food vendors, for example, uh, you know, our mark is one of the biggest food vendors, so they get a contract. So there is, but I actually, I mean, government is the biggest profiter yeah. off of mass incarceration. So when you're talking about dehumanization, so dehumanization, there's obviously a reason as to why the guards and as to why they all use the tactic. It's because it's the easiest way to keep people violent, to keep people, not necessarily violent, but it does build violence within the prison. Um, if you treat people like animals and if you strip them of every right that they from every right that they have and make them feel like they're all they have, yes. it's like a mind game the entire prison. And so, if they know that works, if they know that it keeps people like into these in these systems of incarceration, how are you going to convince them to stop? Like, how are you going to use love to convince them to stop when like these government officials, people that are working within the prisons? have been doing this and they know that they're using enslavement to their advantage. So I just, I mean, I, I'm not, yeah. I mean, I've researched about how um, like even like, like they don't even let visitors in. Like family members will be turned away for the fact that they're wearing a tank top underneath them, their blazer. So there's all of these little things to keep people out. Like how, how does PD3 even get in? So, so you raise a great question and one that I'd like to take a shot at. So what you haven't heard, um, although I said I was the CEO of the PD Green program, what I didn't tell you was that I was also a trial lawyer for 20 years and made some bad choices that landed me in federal prison for five years. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's a challenge. Um, but the truth is I took this job, I'm CEO as of December of this past year, and I took this job for just that reason, mm -hmm. is that the way we change culture is by starting with um, young people in our country that are, are in our colleges and our universities, and we bring them inside. Someone asked me recently if there was one thing I could ask of a superintendent or a, 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 the head of a, a superintendent of an entire state's uh, penal system or correctional system, what would I ask for? And I think I surprised him when I said, I would ask that everyone in a prison and jail be referred to by their name and not their number. And we have to start bringing the humanity back into our correction systems and think about, think about the fact that 95 plus percent of all people are incarcerated are coming home at some point in time. And if we don't do something to help them navigate the challenge behind the walls, then what do we really think is gonna happen when they come home? So that's why education is so important. That's why preparing people but the truth is too, I'll ask both of us, that when we closed our behavioral, our mental hospitals years ago, yeah. um, what we really did was we closed those hospitals, but we just put them all in jail and in prisons across the country. And that's part of the system. About two thirds of the men and women that are incarcerated have some behavioral health issue going through the system. And we have to really have honest discussions. We have to have more of these discussions around the country. Um, I want to, I want to divert a little bit on your subject because I, I'm going to get to drill down a little bit more. 
the reality, and I'm taking this to use of, the reality is, I call this, and my partner's going to laugh at this, I call it diversity, equity, and confusion. Um, because we know that we live in a very, um, in a society where men and women that are black and brown are unbelievably impacted by the system way more than uh, the white population. What's the, what's the answer? Like, how do we start digging down and addressing some of these issues that are that dig deep into poverty and really that are filling many of our prisons and jails in, in this proportion? And everyone out there is talking about, well, we need, we have a DEI council and we're doing great work in diversity, equity, inclusion. But really, what do we need to know and what should we be doing to kind of level the playing field and to kind of fix some of this? I know education is a piece of that, but from your end, what do you see? Give well, us your wisdom. That's a, that's a, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. So is anyone familiar with the uh, Opportunity Insights research from uh, Raj Chetty? Okay, so basically what he did is he looked at anonymized tax records across the country over you know, 50 years. And he's able to show um, outcomes, and these can be outcomes related to education, income, incarceration, based off the poverty level or the resources available in your household when you were a child. And so it's fascinating research, and, and but it's not going to surprise any of us to know that if you were born in a low-income community, you have a significantly higher chance of being incarcerated when you grow up. You have a significantly higher uh, chance of not completing college or you know, any of the other predictors of upward socioeconomic mobility. So when I think about you know, how, how do you break this cycle, I'm actually reminded of, of a event I went to when I was a graduate student at Princeton. And there's this guy, I forget his name, but I think he's from the Brookings Institute or something. Okay. But, but he came and, and he had done all of this research around what causes poverty, mm. right? Because at the end of the day, if you don't have resources, so I think about my own situation, right? When we were denied housing, we had the, I had the resources to insulate my daughter from the ramifications of that decision. So when he looked at what caused poverty, right, things that we would expect, not completing your high school diploma, having a child uh, as a teenager, you know, marriage and, and kind of the resources that, that come along with, with establishing a family unit. So I think as a, as a country, we really have to invest in the family unit. I mean, at the end of the day, At the end of the day, when we think about the, the, the transmitting of, of the values and the behaviors that are going to help someone achieve success in this country, when we think about resiliency, when we think about education, when we think about work ethic, when we think about these things, there is no entity that's going to be more efficient at delivering that than the family unit. It's great that we have these community organizations. We should continue to invest in these types of things. But at the end of the day, if we do not strengthen the family unit, I think we're going to continue to have these really disheartening outcomes. So I, we, have, we have about 15 or 20 minutes left. And darn up. No, I, I appreciate you saying that. I hope you don't mind me sharing this. I'm from Minnesota, Chicago, born and raised. Are you from the north side of Milwaukee? Yes. See, I already know, right? <laughs> so, um, we can talk about that when it was right. Um, I'm, I'm the only one in my community for about three blocks. My parents were married 45 years, both sets of grandparents over 60 years. My sister and I were the only two in my community to go to college. Mm -hmm. And so when you said that, it significantly impacts. And when my father passed, we started Boy Scout Troop and Basketball, there were 700 people that came to his funeral, all the way from the, the, the drugs on the street to, to people he had impacted through the years. And the, the consistent thread was, you saved my life because you showed me family. So I just wanted to share that. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks yeah. for sharing. Yeah. And I gotta say, this is always, so uh, when I was at the ACLU, one of the weirdest experiences I had was we actually worked a lot with conservative Republican organizations on criminal justice reform. Like a person I'm very close to right now is the general counsel of the American Conservative Union. 
which, you know, was probably, you know, this is a MAGA Republican organization who I disagree with, you know, 90% of the time. On this issue, we agree. And so much of it is from this angle and kind of, you know, Christianity and second chances of, my God, we are tearing families apart. And every time we send someone to prison, it's not just about what we do to him, because 90% of people in prison are men, but it's what we do to their families. And there are people, um, particularly like organizations like Prison Fellowship, American Conservative Union, Faith and Freedom Coalition, that I used to work with all the time. And we would go on lobby visits together where it was like, even the ACLU and Freedom Works. Freedom Works is like the Tea Party. But we agreed all the time. And it was just a man, law and policy maker would look at us, be like, well, if these guys can agree, then something's wrong here. But it's but that's the angle. That's the angle. Well, you're saying Yousef, right? And that, and that's the love part that I'm trying to say, right? We gotta, we can't just throw statistics back. Because unfortunately, we also live in a disinformation era. And I'm sorry, you know, where it's like, that's a challenge we need to recognize. But no one can dispute family, right? No one can dispute, I want my son, I want my daughter, I want my mom, my dad to have a good life. So I would, I would add to that, though. I think there's another piece of it. And I think Yusuf is living proof of it, is that some of us that have gone through the system are now at the table. Um, if you're not at the table, you're often being served as the meal. And we're at the table, we're having these discussions, and we're starting to figure out that we have voice, and, and being at the table is so important. So we, in the last time that we have left, um, I get frustrated too when I go to these things and there's not a real solid takeaway. Like, what can you in this audience do when you walk out the door? What is it that you should be thinking about? You know, who should you be talking to? Where should you be going? Well, first, you should all be calling the PD Green program, making a donation, and offering to volunteer. That's an easy one. So that's an, that's an easy one. Um, but the second piece I want to throw to both of you, can you guide our audience today? Tell us, like, what should they be doing when they walk out of here? What are the advocacy things? What are the things that they might want to, whether it's little or small, what can they do to move the needle? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I, I think you, you have to start with your competencies, your networks, kind of the resources that are available to you. And, and, and when, I, when I say that, um, when we talk about entrepreneurship, and, and really when we talk about affecting social change, it really is a type of, of entrepreneurship. It requires the same resourcefulness, resilience. Um, but you start with three things. You start with who you are. So what are those things that you're passionate about? What are your interests? What you know? So what are your areas of expertise and who you know? And you leverage those three assets and resources uh, in a way that's gonna move the needle um, to create opportunity for others. I love it. So I, um, I, was, uh, I supervised a thesis this year that was about voting in New Jersey jails. I know we have some government people here from New Jersey, but uh, uh, my student, we, when, when you're incarcerated in a jail, there are, there are really only two reasons. The vast majority of people in jail are pretrial detainees, right? So that's what Jeff mentioned. They can't afford cash bail which means they haven't been convicted of anything, which means they still have the right to vote. But the other category of people in jail, which is about 20%, are people who are serving a sentence less than a year, which means they're serving a misdemeanor usually, which means they actually haven't been disenfranchised because disenfranchisement laws apply to felonies. So that means that people in jail have a right to vote. So my student, um, Ella Gantman, who's graduating this year, um, decided to focus on, in New Jersey, are people actually able to exercise their right to vote in, in jails in New Jersey. And she proved it basically that basically no. She, and, and she did, she did 106 public records requests, whatever. But one of the things that's most fascinating about her thesis is that she looked at programs like in Cook County, Chicago, and we had uh, the gentleman, I think he left, yeah. Cook County is... Yeah, uh, Cook County is one of the few jails in America right now where they bring the voting booths inside the jail and people in jail and you see the voting participation like skyrocket. The people who make these types of decisions are almost always your local board of elections. It is as hyper local as it gets. 
It is your local, you know, per se, you know, jail warden, which is usually run by the county, which usually, you know, the people who are elected to be the county executive or who are elected on a county council or city council usually run in elections that aren't contested. There's literally an election here in Princeton on June 6th. I live in Princeton. There's an election here on June 6th. Not a single one of the, of, of, of the offices is contested. Not a single one. Meanwhile, my daughter's school is going to close so everyone could go vote. But local elections are the most low propensity races, is the most low voter turnout races. They tend to have participation like 15% of eligible voters. That is where you could have the most impact. Like literally, get to know your jail. Get to know, are people voting in your jail? Convince your local officials to actually, when they are running for office, part of your constituency is actually people who are incarcerated in the jail. Did you go and also meet with them? They're part of your constituency. In fact, most county, you know, city budgets tend to go about, I don't know, 25% to your, to your police. State budgets, prisons, jails, and police are a huge part of your state budget. Your, your policymakers don't feel accountable at all to that. Change that. No, I guarantee you, no matter where you live in America, your jail is being neglected. There are people in there who are being neglected. They're invisible. Make them visible. And I could talk about all the different ways you could do that. No, so you raise a really good point. We saw this in Philadelphia recently, where we had, a, actually in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia in the city, but we saw a governor's race where um, actually the, the vote uh, for our current governor uh, was driven by men and women that were black and brown in some of our demo most democratic parts of Philadelphia and Allegheny County uh, that drove it. And, and so I think voting is part of it. Um, I wonder too how much we should be um, thinking about those that are coming home. Yeah. And the one suggestion I would have for all of you, and we're gonna open up for questions, get thinking, um, is this, you know, we have 600,000 plus people come home every year. Um, when was the last time that you knew or heard of someone that was coming home and did something really small, like say, welcome home. Or what is it that you might need? Or how can we help you? Or you know, maybe I might have a job lead for you. Um, I can help you with your resume. Um, little things, it's the little things. And I often give advice on, on justice issues and reentry and people coming home. And the one thing I always say is assume nothing. Assume nothing when people come home. You have men and women, sometimes that have been down for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, I was with a gentleman the other night who had been down 30 years. This is long before Google didn't even exist at the time. And he came out and was tasked with getting an iPhone, communicating with his parole officer and understanding how to, um, he didn't know what a debit card was, couldn't get a bank account, had never had a bank account actually. Um, all these really basic challenges that people coming home face all the time and we shouldn't assume anything. We should ask those questions. How can we help? And there's reentry programs all over the country here in Princeton. I know PD Green does some amazing work, and we have some of our staff here today in supporting men and women, not only behind the walls educationally, but helping them guide them. Look, persistence in education isn't just about being able to do fractions, right? It's about all those other life things that distract you from that. And if we can knock away some of those barriers, like helping provide diapers for their children and basic food support and housing and all those things that we're working towards, um, that's part of the solution. That's things that we have to chip away at. Um, I want to open, spend some time, and I'll give you guys last words in a minute, but uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. We'll go back there first. One quick comment regarding the voting in the jails. I, I live in Cook County, Chicago. The other reason, the election commission was always there. But, but the main reason there's been a change about people temporarily incarcerated in jail is a progressive sheriff. Yeah. When you talk about officials. Uh, Tom Dunn, We have a right? very different kind of sheriff than yeah. the one who was there, there for all of the daily yeah. administrations. Oh, yeah, who was elected. Right. right, yes, yes. Right, these low, so, so the criminal justice reform movement, beginning in around 2016, shifted strategies. I was part of deciding on that shift. And we decided to focus on these local races that had huge impacts on the criminal justice system and that no one was paying attention to. Mm -hmm. So the first race that I ever got involved, and I got the ACLU involved for the first time in its 100 year history, was this race in Philadelphia, an open CDA race, 
by this guy who no one had heard of. His only thing on his resume was how many times he sued the police by the name of Larry Krasner. Mm. And what did we do as part of our strategy? Talk about, I hired more formerly incarcerated people when I was day silly than anyone else. And for this race, we hired 51 formerly incarcerated people, trained them on how to do canvassing, and we had them knock on the doors of ACLU members to say, look, I'm formerly incarcerated. Um, there's a race for DA happening in your jurisdiction right now. Can I tell you about why it matters, why it would have changed my life? And we would get calls from our local ACLU members be like, oh my God, this was like, you guys always usually just ask me for money. This was the first time you ever asked for me <laughs> actually. And it, it changed their lives because they were talking to someone who was directly impacted. Larry Krasner gets elected, changes the whole political structure around DAs. And got, by the way, reelected overwhelmingly by directly impacted communities, which is very different than the national narrative that you hear. But this is an example what this gentleman said of the, the decision making they get to make. If you elect a progressive sheriff, they could say, we're going to bring the voting booths into the jail. And I don't mean progressive, actually, reform oriented. That's actually because because there are Republicans who are better than Democrats on this. There are Democrats who are horrible on this issue. Right now, Democrats in Florida are pushing for an expansion of the death penalty. Um, um, so so it, it really is genuinely nonpartisan. Um, so, so yeah, that was a great example. So you could not, so this was not planned at all, at all. But Jonathan from my office is here. And Jonathan, uh, we recently got a contract with um, what district attorney's office? Um, there was Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia district attorney's office were doing um, <laughs> We're doing work, um, diversionary work with them. So folks who are diverted from the criminal legal system, they're participating in an alternative uh, to incarceration program, and we're tutoring them. Amazing. Yeah, that's great. So um, yeah, so we, yeah. we didn't we set that up. Okay, I'll shut up. Thanks so much. Um, there was a gentleman here that we'll get to you. Yes, sir. Uh, for Joseph, um, where do you think the most effective, based on like your personal experience? Um, Point to intervene is. Is it at risk youth? Is it people that are incarcerated? Is it people coming out of incarceration? Where is, you think, the best potential for benefit to that population? I mean, I don't know that there is one you know, single group or, or a panacea that's going to substantially move the needle one way or another. Um, I think it's context dependent and where, where can you have the greatest impact? Right? If, if you're able to create a, a, an effort that focuses on at-risk youth and you can bring the most resources to bear on that demographic, I think that's where you need to focus. Um, but it's important that we all understand that on this continuum, there's always that possibility for change. And there's always that possibility for positive contributions to society. So we truly do have to be a country of second chances and, and opportunities. And, and we, you know, I love this country. I've had the privilege of working on three continents and I only believe my story is possible here. I truly believe that. But we truly don't extend opportunities the way that, that we'd like to believe that we do. I mean, I don't know if you're already, but you know, look, the data shows that, right, it's people between the age of like 14 to 25 who, and I'm not gonna say I'm most likely to commit crime because that is an incorrect way to think of it. I would say to that age, we would most likely be arrested for crime, right? Because those are two different ways to think it, right? I'm sure crime is being committed. I love reunions, but I'm sure there's underage drinking happening over the next few days. <laughs> exactly. But no one's gonna get arrested for it because no one's patrolling right now to, uh, to arrest people for underage drinking. But if you happen to be underage drinking on the stoop in Trenton, just you know, 10 miles down the road, and a cop passes by, it's gonna be a different situation, right? So, and I'm stating the obvious here. But we know that that's the population that comes most in contact and ends up. So all the interventions need to go there, right? And there are two types of interventions. One is, I do believe that um, you know, this population is just over-policed, I do. You look at the vast, even, uh, the FBI releases an annual data set this is the FBI, this is not ACLU propaganda, that says here are the number of arrests a year. There are 10 million arrests on average in the United States every year. 80% of those arrests are for misdemeanors. So the lowest of the level, right? The, the disorderly conduct, the, uh, the trespass, the, you know, the, the, the minor stuff. 
5%, 5% of the 10 million arrests that happen a year, according to the FBI's own data, are for violent crimes. Right, the stuff that no one's saying there shouldn't be intervention. Right, the homicides, the rapes, which are absolutely under, under, uh, underreported. Um, the, uh, the, the robberies, right? The, uh, the, 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 the first degree assaults. Right now, police spend most of their time in America going after low level stuff. And that doesn't happen at Princeton. It happens in other communities that are, tend to be lower income and, 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 and disproportionately black and brown. And I generally believe that has, so that's a main. So that's on the system side what needs to change. And then at the same time, we shouldn't be just moving away from such communities. And that's where I think the conversation breaks down a lot on the national level. No, 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 we need, instead of investing more police in those communities, we need to have other interventions. After school programs, there's so much data that shows after school programs like the best investment. Look, we haven't proved this yet as a community, so I want to be very careful. I know this is a smart crowd and we should be careful. We haven't proved causation here, but I do believe, but it's my opinion, I haven't proved it, that the reason that crime went up during COVID is because the social fabric you know, disappeared. Schools were closed after school programs closed. The same remedies that we kept talking about is how do you reduce crime disappeared. And guess what? Crime went up. Um, um, so in some ways, the COVID story, I believe one day will be told as actually giving us indicators of how do you prevent crime? You know, New York City became so much safer as a city because we invested, you know, in a more of a social safety net. So I think that is the population and it's mo both like stopping so that po so much of the police, civilian, including the schools, um, and, but, but, but putting something else in there, other support services, better schools, better after-school programs. And I would just add to that, diversion. diversion if you can keep yeah. people out of the system, well, that's a long, far away to yeah. handle forever. Yeah, so this uh, is directed primarily towards Yusuf uh, and our journalists with the discussions we've had about family. Um, so your story speaks so much to me. Uh, my family, a lot of them are from Milwaukee. Um, I would say that I come from a broken family. My mother had me when she was 15, and I was very privileged to sort of navigate these. I'm sorry, some people in the back can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. 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 Excellent. Okay. So, as we were talking about like family values and the importance of having a sort of intact nuclear family, I definitely agree with that. But coming from the perspective of having not had that as I was growing up and navigating the world in a very isolating environment. And I'm in a very privileged position to be at Princeton now as an alumnus. I volunteer for uh, Princeton Less Electors Project, which is part of White Bitty Green, so also volunteering at Wagner State. And I guess my question is uh, something that's been absent in this discussion is the, um, the uh, identification or the acknowledgement that sort of these dehumanizing systems are baked into the architecture of this country from the transplant. Atlantic slave trade to chattel slavery, Jim Crow, all of that. And I sort of have seen the impacts of those systems on my family and people I love and care about. And even though I have this privilege to sit here and say these things, I still have this intense loss from that. And I'm just wondering for you, how do you sort of maintain your inner peace and your tranquility while facing these systems and doing this important work? Great question. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, well, everyone knows how great Princeton is. And when I was at Princeton, I had an opportunity for like the first time to see like a life coach. It was a woman, uh, amazing, Shafalika. I don't know if she's still here, but one time she remarked to me, she was like, you, you never want to talk about the past. You just kind of always are thinking about the future and, and, and this is just kind of your orientation. And I would say maybe that's my personality, maybe that's a decision I made subconsciously, but there's so many things in my past and I, I think about you know my mother who, you know, I love her so much, but she struggled from alcohol and drug addiction. I mean, I watched my mother prostitute herself out to be able to, you know, put, put food in our house. I mean, just tra traumatic things. Um, but, you know, those are things I, I don't control. 
But what I do control is the environment I provide for my daughter, for the expectations that I set in my household, and for the, the, the standard that our family will uphold moving forward. And, and that's how I pursue things. Awesome. So um, we have time for, we have two more. Um, we'll go gentlemen and then. Uh, first of all, I, I'm so happy I came here today. I was so happy to learn about this program and listening to this. It's very inspiring. It's very thought provoking. It's very um, heart filling. Um, we're, and so, so my question, and some of it's been covered already, but I'll just kind of re reiterate it. Um, a lot of the argument for being for, for hard on crime groups is well, if we increase the penalties, then we're going to scare people away. And I honestly don't think there are too many people who are sitting there saying, you know what? There's a 23% chance that I'm going to get caught and I'm going to do this, and there's a 47% chance, and let me run through my expected return, and it's worth it. <laughs> and I, I don't think anyone's doing that. And, and frankly, I don't think anyone's doing that on the incarcerated side either, but you know, what have you. Um, I guess my question is, what can we, both as a society and as individuals, do to help keep people from being in the incarceration system in the first place? And whether that be, I mean, part of it is certainly reforming the system, and there, we've seen laws for various I mean, marijuana crimes are non-existent nowadays, essentially. Um, and there are still people in jail who, for marijuana crimes. Um, but also, on a personal basis, how do we work on reducing the us versus them mentality? Um, and, and, it, and it goes all ways. I mean, I, I think, I, I, I can't speak from experience, but from a lot of the research, a lot of the reading I've done, one of the reasons that people, that some people go back to jail is because that's their community. That's their family. That's, that's what they know. And how can we as individuals break down the us versus them other than to just try to spread the love where we can. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, so when I was at Princeton, I took a, a class uh, with a guy, uh, Daniel Kahneman. I don't know if anyone read the book, Thinking Fast, Slow. Um, but he, remember one of the, the lectures, he, he talked about this cognitive bias known as the actor-observer bias. And, and basically what that means is when somebody does something or something happens to somebody that we identify with, we associate that to factors outside of their control, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if our cousin, you know, gets into uh, an encounter with the criminal legal system, all oh, poor Tommy, you know, he had a hard shake it life, you know, his dad disappeared, blah, blah, blah. But when it's somebody that we don't, have an association and identify with, we ascribe that failure or that circumstances to some individual shortcoming. You know, that person is just, you know, he's always been troubled. <laughs> you know, there's something wrong with them. And, and so I, I do think that that is a deficiency in, in the way that we approach things. And, you know, if, if we truly could empathize with each other, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think we would approach things yeah. differently. I'll be quick. Um, and I, I haven't been giving you guys a lot of specific policy interventions because I'm trying something new to see how much it resonates, but I'm gonna go now and give you policy interventions. Because you talked a lot about how do we prevent people from coming into the system in the first place. And there are two policy interventions that I'm most excited about. One is um, the movement for alternative first responders. And there's a lot of um, good data now that shows us that it's effective. So the vast majority of 911 calls in America are to things that I think most people would argue actually don't need the police. Yet the police, the way we've structured our society, they're our first responders. I mean, they're the ones. And by the way, you'll hear this from police. A lot of times they get involved in choice they don't want to. Right? Most 911 calls have to do with like a, you know, a local disturbance that's not really a crime or people experiencing a mental health <clears throat> breakdown or suffering from substance use disorder. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation happening right now in America around having alternative first responders. The most prominent one is out of Eugene, Oregon, a program called the CAHOOTS program that's actually been in place for about 10 years at this point. They respond to about 20,000 calls a year. 
where people are still calling 911, but the dispatchers are trained to say, no, 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 that doesn't need the police, we're gonna call. And they get involved when it's someone who's experiencing a mental health breakdown, where they're yelling and sound completely unreasonable. But you know what, they need someone to calm them down. They need someone who's a violence interruptionist. They need someone who's actually trained in social work, not carrying a badge and a gun. Because you know what, if you're a cop being put in that situation, which by the way, many of them don't wanna be put in that situation, well, what if he pushes you? Well, you just assaulted a police officer, are you kidding me? So there's a lot of experimentation happening now in that area and it's proving to be successful. So that's one. The other area, it's a bit more controversial and there's a backlash to it. Remember how I told you there are 10 million arrests a year in the US, that half a million are for all violent offenses combined. Guess what is the number one arrest in America year after year after year? Yes. And how many? And how many arrests a year? If a half a million for all violent crimes combined, one and a half million a year are for drug possession. So they're literally triple the amount of arrests every single year for drug possession. I'm not talking about distribution. I'm not talking about manufacturing. I'm talking about possession. That is, the, that is police spend most of their time arresting people, or the police spend the most of their time, not most, the most of their time, proportionally, arresting people for drug possession. And not for marijuana anymore. That's a lot less. But for serious drugs, and I'm not disputing it, and you know, we have a fentanyl crisis. We have an opioid crisis. That is what police is spending their time on right now and taking these folks to jail. And I think it's the biggest waste of money and it destroys people's lives and it destroys families. So there's one state in America that I was very involved in that effort that has decriminalized drug possession. Who knows what that is? Oregon. 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 It's Oregon. the only state. It decriminalized drug possession. It was a ballot initiative in 2020. It doesn't mean you could still carry drugs. It's just not a crime. And we were at the cusp. We were going to start running these campaigns in other places like Washington State, Colorado, Maine. But we're facing such a backlash right now on drug issues that this is. But I do believe that when you all come back to reunion in, in I want to say in 10 years, that's optimistic. But certainly in 20 years, we're going to be living in a nation that if advocates do their job right, most states will have decriminalized drug possession. And that will dramatically reduce the number of people going into jail. Thank you. So um, Noah, you're a good friend. Um, do you have a really quick one? Maybe. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeff, and uh, to all the panelists. It's just uh, been a fantastic panel so far. My question is coming back to the concept of uh, the public perceptions and how you get the story out and change the narrative. And I think um, you know, almost all of us today would say physical torture, you know, being wrong and ordered is not an acceptable form of punishment. But the status quo we're all coming back to is that, yes, it's acceptable for the state to put someone in a cage, but almost every time. It doesn't matter what. And so I'm just wondering, how do you get beyond that concept? And, you know, I, the ethics don't seem to really jive with me. <laughs> you know, but I don't necessarily know. Uh, this is what I want to write my book on, so yeah, it's yeah. perfect. But look, you live in Chicago. Brandon Johnson just won in Chicago. I know. I know. Um, there you go. So I actually think you, you, you're the one. I actually think Brandon Johnson provides a roadmap for how you could address this because that election was 100% about tough on crime. It was about who could be more. But yet, I thought the way Brandon, maybe you were responsible for that, the way no, he no, talked. No, no. I'm from Chicago. I'm not there anymore. So, okay. But I, yeah. I but I thought the way he messaged his campaign, talking about these issues, it was a way that didn't minimize the problem, which I think the left tends to do a lot, which is a problem right there. But it, it took it head on and it said, you know what? Yes, police play a role. And I'm not saying they don't, but we are not going to arrest our way out of a violence problem. And he talked about his experience being a teacher. He talked about growing up in communities that are most impacted by violence. And he talked about here's a smarter way to do it. And all the media, when, when Lightfoot lost, you know, the, the primary or didn't qualify, the, all the media was like, here we go, it's going to be a tough on crime election. And Vallis, who was the opponent, was all about, we need more cops, we need more police, we need to get these thugs off the street. And he lost. Mm -hmm. And no one expected him to lose, at least in the, in the mainstream media. 
So I think Brandon Johnson, people like him who have the courage to just speak about this in a different way that is human centric. This is what I mean when I say. It. Now it's a mixed bag. We also had in Philadelphia, you know, a mayoral election that yes, the candidate who did take more of, she was never tough on crime, but it was more about that. So I'm not suggesting it's a perfect, but I do think we now have enough examples to show that there's a different way to do it that resonates with voters. Because at the end of the day, that is, look, I, look, I'm a lawyer, I'm a professor, but I actually do believe it's all about political narrative. It's all about how do people feel? And right now, people feel unsafe. And, 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 and the way we need to do it is we need to have people running for office who feel comfortable providing a different narrative. Because right now, I, I deal with these campaigns, and they, they, there's no other way for They don't know how to talk about it. They're like, we need more police. That's how we make us safe. We need more prisons. That's how we make us safe. It's the only vocabulary that they have. And we need to have you know, data to give them to show there's another way to talk about it. And I think, Brandon, I, I think you know, what just happened in Chicago is a roadmap. Well, so he I changed his message, though. As an organizer, he, he was saying defund the police. But once he got to be a, a mayoral cat, candidate he against Bells, he back to yeah. yeah. modified the message. It's land. true. Yeah. It's true. I think defund the police. Right. Was so I, first of all, just a huge round of applause for our two guests. I promised you, I promised you when we began that we would be engaged, right? Yes, we did good. Um, I want to also um, give a shout out to the class of 58 um, who started and put their back together. And also Charlie um, Puttkammer, who's, this was all his brainstorm and wonderful idea. He said, if I'm coming from Seattle, then I need to do something really engaging. And Charlie, thank you so much for getting us on our the PDB program, we, we're here in Princeton. We're at 22 Stockton. You're welcome anytime to walk in our doors. My office is right when you walk in, and I'd love to spend some time and share with you the great work that we're doing, not only here, but as we scale out across the country. So thanks, everybody, for coming, and have a great weekend.